Yo, welcome everyone to, what are we calling, in case you missed it, the Smite Summer Masters recap. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of fun with this one, and my name's Gormaster. I forgot that I need to intro myself, because that's part of this whole thing. Uh, I'm going to be sitting around here with Trelly, who's going to be the lucky one who, who gets to sit I won the raffle, that's about true. It. He won the raffle, and we're going to be talking all about the, the, the Summer Masters that just went on. Long event, two weeks, if you include the, the preliminary bracket. Yep. A lot of crazy things that happened throughout that one that I think a lot of people did not expect. Yep. Uh, but we're going to start at the end, which seems backwards, but it is the right way to do it in my mind. Okay. Uh, talking about the winners specifically, because it's the ferryman, right? They come out. Not the name I think anybody expected to be saying as the winner of this event. <laughs> True. I, I, I distinctly remember we had a waiting room before where we all said Oni Warriors, but to our credit, I believe everyone said... You know, this is a very tightly knit bracket. Second place could go to anyone. So we were yeah. like, yeah, it could be just not anyone in those finals. So we did guess the, the, the bottom two, or the top two rather, but certainly didn't expect a 3-0 sweep in uh, in the ferryman's favor. And the thing is, is like, it, you know, Aurora had said it in his post-game interview where it's like they're not, they don't try to be this like tournament team. It's just they happen to learn so much throughout the phase that by right. the time the tournament comes around, they're just playing better than you. Yep. Uh, and that kind of brings me, I think, to a, a conversation we were having going into it, which was, you know, you go back to like week one and Sino's locking in like Nike and Surter and, and you see Aurora playing like Op Wash at one point. Yep. And like... That one's that one's definitely a little goofy. The other two, they worked the yep. first time they played them, uh, and they won. But one thing we were talking about a lot coming into this was like God pools. What are they playing? Yep. What are they going to be? And so I think we actually had a graphic brought up that is Sino and Paul's God pools because I think these were were kind of wild to me, uh, and it's mainly because you know you look at it, you have. Five unique picks across the two of them. Okay. But the thing is, is Paul also had like 10 bands every time yep. <laughs> going his way. So like, I would argue four of those five are things that you're going to see Paul play on a good day normally. Mm -hmm. And that was with target bands towards yep. him. And Sinos, I wanted up there, and that's just because look at how many of those got, like, I mean, there's one Nike game. Got to got to get that out of the way. But the rest of those... We're a lot more meta, we're a lot more, hey, this is what, what should be played, what will be played, and what will be good. Right. And I think me and you had talked about it, but the Erlong fit their style because it's like, hey, Sino, you don't need to be the carry. Paul can be the carry. Yep. You just got to set up. Exactly. And I think that's all Erlong brought was like, just, you know, blink in. I'm going to build like three tank items, sometimes even four tank items. Nine turns blessing, pin, like slow, just all, all types of CC to set up for yeah. the squad. But that was the other thing, right? If you, I'm bringing us back to that previous waiting room. I said if there was going to be a team that would beat the Oni Warriors, it mm -hmm. would be off a new patch. You know, Myth wholeheartedly disagreed, but I said it's got to be new meta. And what comes into the meta? Tanky junglers. Sino was already playing them. Everyone had to start going like Robin with three tank. Yeah. Items. You know, like all these, like Erlong Shen comes back into the mix. All these tanky warriors that you need like three tank items for. Sino's like, this is my bread and butter as is, right? I'm just going to go towards the Erlong, build as much tank as I want and try and set up for my squad. The Rat, he didn't build that tanky, but the Pele, if you remember that game, it yep. was a lot of tank stats as well. So tanky junglers come into the meta. Everyone else is a little bit gone. And Sino's like, wait, this kind of this kind of works for me and it ends up benefiting the Ferryman pretty well. Now, I want to know, it, if do you think if you take, let's say, like a, a two off of the E set or, or, or one off of the, the Rat mm -hmm. or maybe even swap Nike out? Yep. Would this have been a meta where they could have played a Surtur in the jungle and had it look pretty good? I mean, I think the difference between Surtur is he does have decent CC, but it's so it's so much easier initiation with the Erlong, right? Yeah. You just blink in, find the taunt. Surtur, you do have like the stun, which works, but I think because Nike, it, it could work. I just yeah. think these two do it a lot better. Sino's play style was, I'm going to blink in, I'm going to pop relics, and then everyone else dives, and Nike does that very well, Erlong does that very well. Surtur does, but you got to think... He goes up to the sky. He falls down from the meteor for 20 seconds. Like, it, mm -hmm. it takes a bit to get that same effect. And it worked really well, right? Because, yep. like, we, you know, we're talking about the fact they 3 0 the Warriors, they 2 0 the Leviathans. Mm -hmm. And admittedly, they 3 2 the Hounds. 
But that one was that's one of those sets that you go back. There's like several times where you're like, if this happens for the Hounds, they win that set. Yep. If this happens for the Hounds, they win that set. And that's the thing, like about that Hound set. This is the reason I thought the Warriors were going to take that so handily. It seemed to me the Hounds had the formula down. Yeah. How how to beat the Ferryman? They had the formula down in picks and bands. They said set. Paul, you're not getting this. Hebo, you're not getting this. Hell, you're not getting this. And whenever that happened, the set usually went pretty well for them. Mm -hmm. Then the Warriors come in, they watch that set, and they say, hey, we're going to give Paul set and Hebo. We just want Thor. Like they, they prioritize Thor every time, and it just, just it did not get the same level of value of what Paul was able to grab. And those picks and bans, I mean, they change it, like virtually everything, it feels like, oh, in yeah, the finals. 100%. You come in, the Levi's, uh, you know, I think, I can't remember if it was me and you or me and Miff on that set, but I remember. We were watching it, and that oh, was me and Dave, and it just did not feel like you were getting this crazy fight from the, the Leviathan. So the the you know for the ferryman, it was maybe a, a quick little warm up for him, nice two zero, move forward, play a very patient game, and then you start to win. Then you get to the Hounds talk, and there were a couple of games like this one where Paul just goes sicko mode and, yep. and literally. It didn't matter what you did that game. It didn't matter what you were trying to do. Paul was 10-0 and at one point, so, and, and he was on Hebo. There's nothing you could do beyond that. But when you get to, as you said, the Warriors, and suddenly it's like, hey, Paul gets to play all these picks that we're told Paul should not be allowed to play. Yep. They didn't. We didn't get to see him have to go that deep. You, you know, they targeted some weird bands. They 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 prioritized some weird picks. I know I saw some people talking about the fact that they think that at least for the the Warriors. And I guess I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because we were going to talk about specific sets. But I think there were some people saying like Sot has a great lane matchup yep. against everybody that isn't Baskin. Mm -hmm. But then it's Baskin on the other side, and suddenly you know we're we're panning over to the solo lane, and he's locked up under the the Titan. And or under the tower and unable to do anything, and some of that's maybe God choice, but some of that's also just the fact that at least matchup wise, it felt like he wasn't able to get the upper hand over Baskin, and Baskin got to play Robin what two games in a and row I, and that looked was really good. That was the big issue in my mind, right? Again, they're prioritizing this Thor pick. Look at the look at the gods on the left side of your map. Why? What what was the value trade? You gave up Hebo and Robin and Marty, which is just a disgusting top three. Yeah, to get Thor. Lancelot and Iza, like Iza's fine. Netroid and Awesome Jake had a great lane, but everything else to me seems pretty lackluster in in comparison to what the the meta was for this tournament. So that was my biggest issue, and that's why I don't. I still think it was justified that we were all expecting the Warriors to have such a good time. It just seemed like picks and ban wise, this was a, an odd choice. Every time I saw their top pick or their bans, I was a little bit questioning it because Cyclone Spin. We didn't. We don't have a god graphic for Cyclone Spin, but I can assure you, he ha he could turn his brain off because he got to play Marty, I believe, like six times in a row or something like that. He he really did not have yeah. to think, and we kept asking him like, well, "Was that the plan?" He's like, "Well, I just kept saying if I get Marty, I'll take him," and then they didn't take Marty, and I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna play Freya," and then <laughs> it was just a fantastic Freya game that last set. So I don't think Cyclone had to think too much, honestly. His dual lane was pretty free. My favorite thing was how he was. He even said he was like, "Yeah, so I'd planned on playing Freya more, yeah. but I just kept getting Marty." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was waiting for them like, to ban it, but they just never did. I do want to see. I'm gonna type uh, Cyclone Spin. It was it, it was it helps at least four times in a row, I believe. I may have so been exaggerating with. He this. had one game on Jingwei. Don't even remember that. Don't remember that, if I'm honest with you. But he won with it, 6.5 KDA. One game on Freya, 6 KDA. That was the very last game. Right. Three games on Kernanos. 1-2, lost one. Uh, you know, 1.8 KDA. That one probably happened a couple of times, I think, in the Hound set. Mm -hmm. uh, four games yeah. on Marty. 75% win rate, 16.8 KDA. Like, he did not have to do anything. That's what I'm saying. And I could tell because he would just get up and go to the bathroom during picks and mids, like, grab me Marty, and then he would leave. And then he would just get Marty for free. He didn't even have to participate in the discussion because why would why would you not at that point? It was kind of free. Yep. I mean, as, as far as things go. I like, And maybe the easiest picks and bans you got to know. Hey, Marty's up. All right, yeah, just lock that in. All right, I'm going to get some chips. Like, what, what else are we playing? <laughs> oh, right. Aurora's going to lock in Ganesh, and that's something that nobody else is playing right now until the very end. It became like the first <laughs> top pick, top ban. I actually love that Ganesh just rose in popularity so much because he's just a fun time. And it's it's because, and I think, uh, you know, we talked about this with some of the support players, but like... Aurora has been described as annoying 
which is the best way to be described if you're you're a support player. A support player in game, not in game, yeah, very not specifically in game. Like playing against a roar was annoying. Right. That's what everybody has said about playing against him. I think we got a ton of videos from last year where we said like, what what do you think about playing against a roar? And they, like almost everyone said the same thing. He's just so annoying in game. Yep. And that's exactly what Ganesh does. Like, okay, what's Ganesh going to do? Well, he's either going to lock you in place with a dash, or he's going to lock you in place with an ult, or he's going to silence you so you can't do anything. Yep. And at that point, you know, you've got so much annoying things to, to do to the other team that it's just, man, it's just obnoxious. <laughs> and I think it fits their play style really well. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for everybody else, they had to deal with that. So Ferryman come in. They look great against the Leviathans. Yep. There are, I, I mean, I think Levi's Hounds, not Levi's Hounds, Ferryman Hounds was just such a great set to, to be able to watch. And then Warriors was a fun set to watch, especially if you're a Ferryman fan, but maybe not the one that was most enticing. This was the one that was really interesting. I mean, first off, look up, it was 19 minutes, there was one kill on the board. Uh, and then you go to 10 minutes later, and they've now got nine more kills. And that's really what this this entire one felt like, was was just relaxing. This is where some of the wins for the the Kernanos, for Cyclone, come from. And I think this plays into to more of what they were saying. Like, if they don't have an E-set there, I wouldn't be surprised if Cyclone's playing Freya. Yep. Just to have some magical damage. Uh, but I think it worked out so perfectly that he was able to keep that pick in the Until back Until literally the end. Because he did give us that secret piece of information. Like, hey, we scrimmed these guys and I never played the Freya. Right? Like, I, I was holding it in the back for good reason. But I think this was just... It wasn't lopsided. Of course, Leviathans were able to find some success. But again, it just seemed like the Ferryman had such a good read on what the meta towards the end of the tournament was going to be like. Yeah. You can sort of see like the what became top like top three necessary gods that need to be played. The Feynman were getting relatively easily at the beginning of this tournament just because no one was really clocking how strong they were going to be. It's I think there's a lot of things like we talked about this team for the entire phase. And like by the end of it, one of the things I think we were all saying was like, damn, if this team can figure out like their meta whatever it is that yep. they want to play 100 percent. they're set and like you said we get the perfect storm of paul eating bands on picks that weren't the bands that you need to be worried about like he got to play set and hebo and hell like he still got his gods yep. uh and then man that's not even considering the fact that he didn't get to he didn't have to play like a Scylla who's not in the meta or he didn't have to play the morrigan mm. anything like that and so picks was like i think a huge discussion point because that allowed paul to, to flourish yep cyclone didn't have to flourish because he just looked good on marty the whole time I mean, he was consistent and that's all you need from your adc at that point yeah. right like he, he just did consistent great damage and did not have to worry about getting camped because marty's so safe it just again he was on easy mode this this weekend then you also get like you said sino getting to play tanky stuff just the stars aligned 100%. it feels like for for what we needed like and and then you get baskin who's really good and can play anything anyway so like yeah he hey yorm's in the meta cool he'll play it whatever in my mind baskin's been the standout for this whole split like e even when the ferryman weren't looking good i mean they were looking fine right it's like that that, that whole side of the the order in the chaos division was yeah. looking okay but i think baskin every game was you know I'm not gonna say carrying but certainly was pulling his own weight so that was never a question mark oh, for, for sure. me it was it was a lot of is the duo lane going to you know show up? Are they going to be able to get aggressive, which they certainly did? And then of course, is Sino going to lock in you know the sort of tanky style junglers, and will it work? And in this case, it definitely did. And it's interesting now looking at it, at least for Baskin, he played Raven twice in finals, and those were the only two games of Raven he played the entire weekend. But his Thor looked good when he played it. His yep. tier looked great. Uh, then like a Hades game, a Yorm game. Uh, and a Wukong game. That Hades game, unfortunately, was a loss. But the rest of them, all all wins. The tier had a win that looked really good. I think that was the last game. And then a tier win that he still looked really good, but he lost. Mm -hmm. uh, and so little moments like that. But they just, they look good. Ferryman win. Uh, and it's because they play incredibly great. So now that we've discussed the winners and why these they's done did winnings. Mm -hmm. We can go back to the very beginning right. <laughs> and look. Uh, started out long, long time ago, which is, is specifically the SCC bracket. And six teams enter. Two teams move towards the main bracket from the end of it. That's the Mambo and the Wargs. Uh, and very specifically looking at this and, and, and looking at the teams, two a lot duo, of them... Duo, duo. <laughs> yeah, well, not only a lot of 2-0s. There were the, the interesting moments. Like the Sages had some really good you know, plays and, and really good games. But obviously the Wargs... And Hex Mambo looked impeccable. And what was interesting to me, and 
there's some substitutes that came in. So like the first seed, the solar scarabs not doing as well is unfortunate, but I think it's nice to see that the second and third seed in Europe were able to do so well. Yeah. Speaking of which, also the third seed in North America, the Valkyries who come in, who had had a, a very phase, uh, suddenly showing up and, and being able to at least go as far as they could. Hmm. Um, still stumbled towards the very end. There were some moments between them and the wargs that were not clean, but it was it was just scrappy, and whoever made it through made it through. And that's the thing. It's it's hard to give credit to like the wargs and the Valks when you see how dominant Hex Mamba was, right? Yeah. Because it's just like they, they didn't drop a game. They they looked so good. They came, and this is why we didn't expect any SEC teams to be able to take any games off of SPL teams, right? It just seemed like the SEC split in its entirety was a bit wishy-washy. There wasn't like this definitive top seed. It seemed like yeah. everyone was able to take games off each other. And because of that, and also because of some of the the questionable God choices that we saw from some of these NA teams, it, it, it was just not one of those matchups where we're like, oh yeah, th- this is gonna be like easy. But of yeah. course, Hex Mambo, I think in particular, I'm not going to say shocked us, but definitely once they, once they got on land, they showed up. Yeah, and they're a team I think we're going to talk a lot about, but we can, at least for the the, the, the the bracket that they played through, I mean, Hex Mambo was dominant. Yep. And there were even points, I can't remember which SP, there was an SPL team, SPL players that were like, Hex Mambo was like the better version of what the Kings were trying to do. Yep. For out all of this. So they come in, they look really good. And I think you just get... I mean, some magic that happens, right? Johnny is an is amazing player, and I think that when you talk about Hex Mambo, Johnny almost always comes up. Of course. But there is something later I think we're going to be talking about that involves Johnny, so we can really just kind of we can, we can close the, the pipeline on him for a little bit since he's going to come up a little later. Look at the other four, and that's actually something that came up pretty often, I think, in the this bracket where there were games where Johnny didn't have those stellar performances. And by that, I mean he was like 3-2 and two instead of 12-2. and two. Yeah. <laughs> But everybody else on the team stepped up in those moments. And so it wasn't just, hey, our jungler looks insane. It was, hey, everybody on this team is really good. It's just Johnny's the one who stands out. Now it was like, okay, if Johnny's not going to stand out, the rest of us can step up and, and, and match. And I think that was uh, a big part of their success is because, you know, the duo lane, I think, always looked good. Spudio was very rarely behind in lane, which is something that you, you really need from your duo. And, of course, Julio and Hawk really had some standout performances for me. I think Miff was singing Julio's praises a bunch on the desk just because of how consistent he was. And not only that, but, again, remember, this was at the beginning of this of this new patch. We weren't quite sure what the solo lane meta was going to be. And Julio was very dominant on things like the tier, the King Arthurs that were coming yeah. up. There was a lot of different uh, picks coming out of the solo lane that we weren't necessarily expecting to have that much impact. And Julio was definitely uh, not only getting pressure in lane and letting... Johnny come over and maybe sap some farm, find some ganks, things like that, but making such a big impact uh, once he rotated out as well, which is exactly what you want from a solo laner. And they get to come out and just look phenomenal, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, every single game they played, especially in the prelim bracket, just slaughtered a lot of people. Uh, were were by and far hedge weren't untouchable but definitely were were in control. The team that came the closest to them, the Wargs, right, right behind them, they look good throughout a lot of that but Trelly, they they were like the epitome of what double elim can mean like yep. getting knocked down i believe early by hex mambo and then having to just claw their way through team after team after team and look sometimes it wasn't as clean as it could have been sometimes it wasn't as uh, as, as as smooth sailing as maybe they would have liked but they still got to the top and i think there's a lot of again a lot of players on this team that have played really well Kana is almost always at the, the forefront of that conversation for me just because of the fact that he has been, I mean, time and time again, now twice on the big stage, back to back at Worlds uh, and the run up to that, plus now here. I think Kana has just looked amazing. Yeah, certainly. This is a team, and again, it, it's, it, it was hard to, to loop them into the same conversation because of how dominant Mamba was. But now if you take Wargs compared to just about everyone else besides Mamba, yeah. that, that's where I, I tend to look towards that, that praise route as well. I think, of course, Kana has to be spoken about. Always lights out from the solo lane. Really been, you know, impressed with his performance throughout. Just about the entirety of being able to watch his career. But I think that the the duo lane was also looking very crazy. There was times I remember specifically where I was casting, and I was like, how, why why is Davy stepping up so far? He plays so aggressive, which can sometimes be very good when you're popping off, and then other yeah. times you get caught out. You have a lot of deaths. But I think that's just his style of play, right? I think that he likes to. 
play sort of like Coast, where he likes to get up and aggressive, try and find those 1v1s. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But at the very least, he's making plays, yeah. which is you know more than you can say about a lot of these ADCs. And you got to think, at least for a while, that guy had practice against Coast regularly, yep. which means I, I'd be willing to bet he's probably a pretty damn good carry <laughs> because it takes a lot uh, to try and take him on. A lot of those carries in Europe are, are just insane. Yep. And we've seen at least what Coast has been able to do. Uh, transitioning into the SBL and how well that's gone mm-hmm. for like hey this is your first season like yes it's that weird caveat it's your first season in the SBL Benny's second but like he was a rookie last year so how much is that that you know Ducky has been around for a long time and he's been in the SBL for a long time but they haven't been the most successful runs that right. we've ever seen from a player and then you get a, a couple of these guys who have been in the scene for a while like Coast you know you go back and he's getting pentakills on Mifflin on console and so there, there's this long history where, you, yeah, you're you're a fantastic player. You know you're a fantastic player, mm-hmm. but you, now you're getting to show that I think in a much more like large capacity, right? You're stepping up, and so for what is his his official first year in the SBL, it is insane. I think how far they made it, and the fact that with Ferryman winning. I guess they did technically win their their third fourth spot, didn't they? So they did win third overall. But even if there wasn't that third, like I would have given it to them because it's like, hey, the guys that three won the dragons got three owed. So the team that you took to five, obviously you guys have a have a lot going for you. Right. I'm getting a lot into the hounds here. That's just because they're they did they, that was an insane run from them. I think even 100%. though they didn't win. Uh, speaking of insane runs, and I think honorable mention, right? Which is the team that came the closest to beating the wargs, but then fell just short of where they needed to is the valkyries and this is a team that we kind of expected to do really well and did really well but didn't i don't think lived up to even the expectations i had just given the name power but we're we're pushing this bracket and unfortunately it's just eu might on the other side that that gives them a lot of trouble yeah and and this may have been everyone else uh i think for me i was not expecting much from the Valks and it's just because I've been watching their games throughout this entire yeah, true. season. We've all talked about it. I, and this was the phrase that I use. Practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect and when you're playing things like Anubis, when you're playing things like like they they they, they felt as if either A, they just you know didn't want to go try hard in the SCC which is odd or B, they thought they were so much better they could pick whatever they wanted. I, I was not expecting much from, the, from them this tournament and uh I suppose I was pleasantly surprised with them being able to get some success, but yeah, this is not a team that I felt was given their all uh, in that in that bracket, and because of that, I suppose that I, I, I like seeing some of the success. These like well, seeing these guys on actual tryhard picks felt good, yeah. but maybe it was a rude awakening. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe maybe this was like, hey, maybe we should actually like give it our all in the regular season for that sort of practice. I may be too harsh yeah. on them. Well, it's possible, but you know. You you said we expected a lot. I, I personally didn't. I thought that they were gonna go. You know, I didn't. I did, I I had no hopes of them making it. Yeah. Right. Now that I'm remembering the conversation coming into it, where they were like, like I'm. I remember saying, oh, this team should do really well. And then I, either it was you or Miff. It was goes, probably Miff. I, I Sam's been playing Anubis jungle, yeah, I, and I went, <laughs> oh, like good. And he goes, no. I, yeah. See, <laughs> d- dur- during waiting room when it's us four, I usually bite my tongue because Miff's the negative guy and having two negative guys, no fun. But when yeah. it's just me and you here, I can go. You a can little be harder. the negative. Yeah, I can guy. go a little harder. <laughs> uh, I will give them the 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 credit. Like the the only issue I think I had with them this tournament specifically, right? Like, that, that was that, slice that, off the phase. Completely different this tournament, right? Is that it felt? And maybe this is where the perfect practice conversation yep. comes into it. It felt like if you took Crimson off of Yanis and Thoth. Mm-hmm nothing was happening in mid if you took sam off of like two or three gods nothing was happening in the jungle so it felt like there were a lot of like hey you guys are really good yep but you're also really easy to ban against right now and that unfortunately made like once people figure you out and and with how many games they had to go through people figured them out yep. that's when it gets unlocked and it's like oh well if we just take this away from you that's that's free for yeah. us then why don't we just do that and to the point where i think there was even i think it was game one maybe it was game two versus the the wargs I remember being upset because I was like, why are you not banning this thing yeah. that you know if you ban it, it will make them play worse. Like, make them play worse. Yeah. Uh, you've got the info. You just got to use it. And so unfortunate for them that they fall, but like you said, maybe the rude awakening that we need or that they need 
uh, going in towards like next phase, you know, stuff like that into the future. Yeah, we know they can compete at that level. Oh, for yeah, sure. They, they, they showed up at this tournament. World's MVP in the jungle. They showed up at this tournament 100%. This was not what I, uh, I was expecting from them. And then, as you said, some absolute standout performances. But once these teams kind of picked up, like, oh, there's like three gods we can't let you have. And if we deal with that, our game gets a lot easier. So that maybe, you know, work on some more god pool things, come back yeah. next time, perform even better. I think a winning game by the end of it was you ban Thor, Yanis, Thoth, and then I can't remember what the first pick was, but there was like a first pick that you take away from them as well, yep. and then suddenly the Valkyries crumbled. It, it was not, not the same team that you were playing against if you let any of those picks through. Yeah. Uh, an unfortunate moment for them, uh, but an honorary mention because of how far they got and how much uh, trouble they gave to some of the EU squads. Mm. That does lead us, at least with Wargs and Mambo, so maybe I should have done that backwards. Oh, well, into the main bracket, because those two got to come in, uh, and very specifically, I love this because this is where my brain is at. I had to correct it so many times, and I found a typo in my own little thing where I keep referring to the Ferrymen as the Titans because they've just got that <laughs> core. Uh, but outside of the Ferrymen, so we can ignore that the bottom path to finals okay uh, and look at some of the others because we already talked about those uh i think jumping into one that that really caught me off guard which was the dragon's king set which was one that i think as far as sets go yep is it super memorable no. i yeah no but as far as upsets go it's pretty wild to see I think the dragons doing as well as they did, you know, Mambo going up against the warriors, you know, the, the path that a lot of these teams had to take, even the hounds. I mean, hell the hounds got to the semifinals. They had to fight <laughs> from an SCC team all the way through, yep. uh, but the dragons winning over the Kings, like I said, maybe not memorable, but I think a big eventful eye opener because this was a team on the, the right hand side of the screen, at least for this highlight in the Kings, that was the world champs that, didn't lose a single game during the championship run like that were just so dominant and then Shelly you go and look at at the way a lot of the end of the phase like there was a switch when the gladiators beat the kings they were the first team to do so yep and from that moment on the kings had a significantly rougher patch I think it yeah I think it's more interesting to talk about the fact that it's not that big of a surprise that the the dragons beat the kings right because of how what they came from but i think it's they haven't been able to find their footing so far yet maybe it's this meta uh the dragons i was very impressed because this was another team that i you know expected fine results from but certainly you know not as as dominant as they were leading up to you know when they found the warriors yeah. so uh th they were looking all right i think lasper showed up in a big way i was impressed with how vote and dardes were able to play it's just consistency has always been a factor for this squad and the, the kings are no are no what's the word i'm looking for they're, they're no stranger to it as well consistency yeah. is something they are also having some struggles with so like i said not a memorable set because of that but it's even more shocking that it's not memorable the fact that the kings just get 2-0 and they're out of the tournament so early on right yeah. because they're the camelot kings um i assume they were able to sit back and watch a lot of the meta unfold and realize, oh, maybe we could have done this differently. Maybe that would have been better, et cetera. But just trying to find that level of consistency, the Dragons and the Kings, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to see bigger things from them as, this, as the you know next phase rolls out. And some, one that I think is going to be, like you said, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially there's so much time right now. Like if you're watching this, uh, honestly, at any point before phase two, <laughs> uh, which would make sense the sooner, closer to Masters, it would make sense. But, you know, up until... Well, like September, I think for 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 you know SPL to start coming back, like yeah. you know you're getting towards late August, like you've got months to figure things out, yep. and that could mean that's know. true. It's going to be a completely different meta. I lie. Don't 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 rewatch oh, yeah. Masters. You're well, not gonna, you're not going to learn anything. I think if I remember correctly, the next SPL event is like the last week of the season of Souls. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then it's like a week off of SPL, and then back into the the fray. Gotcha. I'd have to look at the, the year-long schedule. In fact, you go to SmiteProLeague.com, and I'm pretty sure we have a blog post about what is going to be going on over the next few months. Yeah, Roll like, Stars, uh, EU Gauntlet, NA Gauntlet. Yeah, those, stuff. those things are going to be really fun, yeah. I think. Uh, and so I'm interested to see what the Kings have because it feels like a team that, when they've hit slumps like this, are not afraid to make roster changes. That's true. But I don't know what on earth it could look like because I can't think of anyone who takes over any role on that team and is doing it inherently better unless you can like i don't even know if i want to say like poach johnny because then it's like okay but yeah but like twig is really good it's consistency sometimes that the team has yep that's future considerations though 
we're still talking about masters and so we can go to the other one in that main bracket that just really floored me and was fun to watch for everybody Mm -hmm. and that was mambo winning over the gladiators so handedly uh which i think actually is going to come up twice (laughs) in the next couple of minutes uh but they just it, it was you know I'm going to throw the the gladiators under the bus because I think they did say that they hadn't been scrimming coming into this, which like, that's not, that's like a worse excuse than you think it is. That just means, okay, you had a major event and didn't prepare. My my guess is- Like, I didn't study for finals. Yeah, my my guess is the only reason that that was said by whatever player said it, I know who said it, but we don't have to call him out, um, was because that- they, they wanted to scrim, but like somehow the team just couldn't get together, I guess. I don't know. That's the only yeah. reason I could see that being a reason you would even bring that up. Like, oh, we didn't scrim, so that's why we got wrecked. Like, that's a weird thing to say. But you're right. It just seemed like the Gladiators, I'm not going to say weren't themselves, because I don't think they were ever the picture of consistency either. But oh, no, not at all. They were, so, this, was a, this was a messy set, right? Like, this was, this was not a... <laughs> This is not a set that either one of these teams were really proud of at the end of the day, but of course, like, you know, Johnny getting a Penta. I remember, specifically, Johnny was having a rough early game, right? Yep. He was, like, something like 2-7 and seven at one point, and then he, like, shows up and gets the Penta, and it was a lot of, okay, that's Kali getting to late game, but I think it was a lot of Hex Mambo just saying, hey, we, we know that the Gladiators are not going to push this lead, we know they're not going to be able to, like, siege into us, so let's just keep trying, and eventually something will stick, and... With a character like Kali, yeah, eventually you can get your targets rolling like that and just go to Penta. I think, and this is like, actually, this is the perfect time now that I'm, I'm reading the rest of the, the run of show here. Mm-hmm. If Hex Mambo, after beating the Gladiators, played against not the Warriors, yep. like if they were playing the Dragons or something there, yep. I think they have a bigger chance of getting into the semifinals Mm -hmm. than what we had seen in the past. I think the teams like the Hounds probably could have given them trouble. Yep. But depends on the style, right? I mean, there were a lot of people, again, who were saying like Hex Mambo is playing the style the Kings like to play, but they're doing it better than the Kings are right now. Mm -hmm. And it's like the Ferrymen probably beat you because they smacked down the Warriors. The Warriors did beat them, so that, that has to go towards them. But that Warriors set for them as well wasn't like run away they there was a moment where it's like oh wait they could actually get a game here like this this could be a, an actual set and unfortunately uh, the warriors are the warriors and so it didn't happen i think no disrespect to the warriors but the the hounds ferryman side of the bracket now that we get to look at the whole tournament yeah. in hindsight seems like the, the harder it was side. way harder yeah looking at it now so i think if anything mambo had a an easier time just because considering how well the, the hounds and ferryman adapted to yeah. the meta at the end of the day now that we got to watch it it's like, yeah, you might have got off easy with the Warriors. And Good point. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't know how true that is. Again, match yeah. like like the, Johnny could have just been like, hey, there was something that Pantom did that I just couldn't roll with, and of course maybe up against someone else that would have been better. But you know that Fairman Hound set was uh, it was a barn burner. Yeah, that was the one. Uh, not too long from now, we're probably gonna go. Actually, uh, yeah, no, not too long from now, we're probably gonna go into like, hey, here are the ones like you should watch these. Yep. Um, spoiler alert that's, you should watch that that's one. one of them <laughs> um some of the things that we pulled up yeah I, I had ferryman hounds actually like said we'll get touched on here but we talked about it a lot at the <laughs> beginning we still managed to bring it up here uh, and so i can't help it i'm sorry yeah it was just a really good set it went really late though and that's the only downside that's the only like negative memory i have of that set otherwise it was really fun smite mm-hmm. uh, and so we can start going through other little like markers i guess of the event and so up first is something that you you probably should be really familiar with because we just launched a highlight from it which is the bloodiest game the most kills that we saw in this event Glad's coming mambo. in at 42 kills was mambo versus gladiators <laughs> game two not surprising i think in the least considering what johnny did <laughs> yeah I mean, wa- watching that pentakill back, I, if you would have asked me to guess the, the bloodiest game, I would have expected a, a Hounds Ferryman game, but I guess at times they were going like very late without getting kills. But in yeah. this case, yeah, it, it I mean this only slightly offensively. It was like an arena game. It was not a clean game of Smite played yeah. by either team. And it, when, when you say it's like an arena game, what I mean is it's not very structured. You're grouping up, you're fighting. You're usually going like three for three, then you back up and do it again, right? Yep. Like that is that is not typically how SVL games go. It's like <laughs> get a pick, oh, we can force an objective, we can use this to advantage, that sort of thing. Glad's Mambo was a lot of 
let's just throw everything at each other and see who comes out on top. And unfortunately, eventually, Johnny was late game, Kali. Now, I want to ask, because, you know, bloodiest game, 42 kills, you know, we, we just saw the highlights for it. Yep. What do you think is the opposite, the tamest game that we saw? Because I didn't get you, I didn't let you guess. It was, a, it was a me guess. and you cast for sure, I have to imagine. Oh, yeah, it was. Uh, one of the games that we had three kills by 20-something minutes, yeah. probably. But that you really narrowed it down. You went from eight games to six <laughs> games there. Wow. <laughs> Uh, I don't even remember. It, we, we, it was a long week. Yeah, and there were a lot of. I mean, admittedly, there were a lot of tame games. Uh, Warriors versus Dragons, uh -huh. which makes sense. But it was game two, so not the one that the Dragons won, but the ones that the Dragons ended up losing. Because if I remember correctly, it was eight to one <laughs> in favor of the Warriors at the very end. It had nine kills, and Trelly, because there were so few. I'm here and we get to see every You kill. get to see every single I, kill. I'm so and excited. I distinctly remember this one being so Warriors heavy. Because, uh, you know, they had lost game one, and in the post-game interview they said, yeah, we were trying some things out. And game two, it was like they wanted to make sure that there was no argument for that. Like they yeah. knew what they were going to be saying in the post-game interview already. And they said, we need to make sure that not a soul can come up to us and say that we didn't shellack them in game yeah. two. <laughs> Okay, so 13. There we go. There's the three yep. minutes by 20, 23. Three kills by 23 minutes. So you weren't wrong. You nailed that part. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I assumed it was one of the many games that we had that were like that. And unfortunately, it was just, you know, a very passive game from these squads. And then he jumps all the way up to 30 minutes. We get kill number five. And this is what I'm talking about. Like, gold-wise, look how high the Warriors are in the lead. 15k and, and and they still were not able to end I guess props to the J dragons for their defense but when you're up that much it's it, 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 you're thinking that's like a 22 minute game right like, like, was it nine zero it was nine zero I forgot they got blanked yeah I yeah no kills I thought I was I was given credit I saw nine kills in my brain eight one <laughs> eight one it has to be eight one natural like that's the only way I remember the eight I remember discussing 8-0, yep. so it had to be 8-1 if there's nine kills. And then to see the ninth kill happen at the very end, oh no. Yeah. Not, only nine total. That was not a very bloody game. The opposite. of. And it was like game. a 40 some odd minute game. That's what's wild about it. Yep. I mean, that, that, that's what happened. a kill at that point, essentially every five minutes if you sliced it up and, and evenly distributed to them. But it was not evenly distributed because again, not. we got to 23 minutes with only three kills. Yeah. We had a lot of chatting to do that day. We had, a, yeah, we were. You know what? It was a good hangout time. <laughs> that would have been a good one for the the casters after dark, where you get to just crack open a beer and, yep. and, and, like, and relax. Well, let's talk about how nothing's going on. Let the words flow. And two of those kills again. Vote got ganked, and then they just came back and ganked him again. So two of those kills were in like forty five seconds. Yep. <laughs> it really was one piece of action in twenty three minutes. Wild for him. All right. So now we can we can start to, to chip chop our way through. I'm going to let you, we're, we'll play, I guess, a little gamified version of it. Most contested gods. We're going to do pick, ban, and pick, and ban. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to start with pick and ban. So overall, right? Whether yep. if they were banned or picked a lot. Who do you think uh, across the whole event and just the main bracket, what, what gods and or god do you think that it uh, was was the most picked and banned that's tough because the meta changed very drastically Dramatically. towards the end but in my head marty would probably be mm -hmm. towards the top mm -hmm. and maybe thor and thor is spot on for the okay. main bracket okay. thor had an 89 percent. he's 12 picks 12 bands okay he was was one of the most contested picked and banned god yep the whole event it actually goes to hachi and it's just because, I don't know if you remember. Hachi SCC. started, yeah. yeah he was SCC. super heavy. And then SPL, everyone's like, who cares about Hachi? 79% pick ban. He had 10 bans, yep. 28 picks. It's, he's getting carried entirely by the 28 uh -huh. picks. Uh, but yeah, so he, he managed to, to climb to the top. Uh, now, if you're going to, to limit that, so pick and ban. Yep. Which do you want to start? Do you want to start ban or pick? Let's go, let's go pick. Let's go pick first. Cool. Uh, whole event and main bracket. What do you think? Well, Hachi is already top pick. We know that for a fact, right? Or no? Is that not well, you can technically be top pick and ban without being top pick. But but he is. He is. Okay, <laughs> I was going to say, you just told me he got played 28 <laughs> times. I'm not buying that someone else got played more. And then ban. Uh, so then main bracket. 
Oh yeah, no wait, ban. You know what? Just do ban for whole event because it wasn't it wasn't Hachi. If he got picked twenty eight times, no, he well definitely not. No. <laughs> um, towards the end, I'm gonna say top ban was still Thor. Nope, top ban was Yamoja for the whole event. That checks out. Yeah. Uh, and we'll double down. Yamoja was also the most banned for the main bracket. Right, seventy percent of the games yep. saw Yamoja ban. Makes sense. Uh, and then top pick. For just the main bracket, you were spot on the money earlier, which yep. is Marty, right? Because right. at that point, you're getting skewed by Cyclone and Paul stats. Yep. <laughs> uh, not, not bad, Charlie. Not bad, Charlie. You nailed it, honestly. And if we'd limited it to the main bracket, you probably were spot on the money immediately. I mean, SEC is just so long ago in my brain. Yeah, I mean, it was three weeks ago now. And that was a lot of smite to try and process for, for three weeks of memory. Yep. And we had all the the amateur casters in so yeah so you weren't even on every single like splitting up some of that brain power yeah now earliest objective timers which is just for some funsies first blood sino got it against the warriors the earliest in game two it was a 37 seconds in yep yet we still if i remember correctly got to 20 minutes with only three kills Uh, yep uh the fastest tower was actually hex mambo versus the gladiators in game one uh they knocked it down at 10 41 in game uh, the earliest gold fury was the leviathans actually being able to get it over the ferryman at eight minutes 21 seconds in the game uh the pyromancer went down to the warriors versus dragons game three at 13 38 which i think was right when it spawned in or, or yeah. just about and then the fastest fire giant was the warriors against the dragons also in game three 1949 where they they just absolutely dominated it so if oh. you want to see the fastest objectives there are the games to go watch for those uh and then this is something, I mean, if you, you want to chat about it or not, because it was the newest guy on the, the block, the control beacon that was around, which admittedly, I don't, I guess up front, did it change as much of the game as maybe you had thought it, it could or would? I was hoping it would speed up a little bit more, um, but it did force fights, right? I, it, I'm not going to say it forced fights. It forced grouping. There was a lot of, hey, I'm going to go to the beacon. I'm going to stand on it. If people show up, I'm going to leave, and I'm going to watch them cap it. So it was a lot of, I'm going to rotate over. I'm okay with losing a lane, like losing a couple, like a wave or two to rotate over the, the, the beacon for that, that extra stat boost, yeah. but, but I'm not going to commit my life to it. They, it was a lot of let's retreat before we overcommit. So it created grouping. It created urgency, but it didn't create actual fights. They were like, let's not die. You know, people will die for Fire Giant. They will go in to make sure that they have created space and then die. No one wanted to die for the beacon. No. And admittedly, probably rightly so. Yeah. And what's really interesting now that I'm looking at it, because uh, I like just like first control or first beacon control, right? So the initial one. Mm-hmm. But what I'm going to get into is why stats can't always reflect what you need or why you need more context around them. Yeah. So ferryman first beacon control rate, they were number one, 80%. They got eight out of 10. Mm-hmm. So they only lost two of, of the, of the, the first ones. Beacons. Yeah. Of the first beacons. Okay. But this is where it gets really interesting. Because the second beacon and third beacon control rate goes to the Ravens, who had 100% of their second and third beacons. However, they did it in two total games. <laughs> Does it really count or matter? Uh, and so that's kind of that's the, the, the context part of it. Um, Ferryman was second, though. Seven out of ten third beacon control rate. So up against the Warriors, they were doing incredibly well. Mm. Uh, and up against the Hounds, they were doing pretty well. The Hounds show up for the first control rate, six out of 12, which means some of the ones they lost were, I guess, against the ferryman and then second uh, beacon control rate some of the ones they won and that the ferryman specifically lost out on were the second beacons versus the hounds little things like that uh beacon participation you'd not be surprised to find out that most of it was the supports hanging out on top of the beacon and then also because it can be contested for super long the supports spent a lot of time staring each other down at the beacon just in a little corner like hiding it just yeah i i agree with you though it was one of those things that i really hoped would speed things up but then it did not speed things up Mm -hmm. and then like even the push with the titan rarely impacted much we saw one that got to the phoenix line and we saw dozens where they were just just, ignored yeah like just let the the titans push. they're fighting over there we're fighting over here i don't really care and then I think we saw it once where it actually impacted a team so much so that they could not end because they didn't go back and kill the Titan. Yeah. That's well, technically twice. Once in the SEC. And then once in the SPL. Which was day it. one. And then, yes, once in the SPL where a team completely wiped, won a fight, pushed it down to go end, saw the Titan was gone, said, unlucky, backed, 
finished yep. it and then ended like 10 minutes later slowed some things down but you know happens uh the unfortunate nature of it all so now Shelly, yes uh, we get to the the end where you i'm gonna let you start out so sets that you think are must watches from masters yep for, got, for anyone who watched all of this mm-hmm. and for some reason didn't just commit to watch yeah, it. it. Well, like, it, there's a lot more smite from Masters than there is this video. Yeah, three must-watch sets for me. Okay. Obviously, uh, we're going to start with SCC upsetting SPL. Mambo yep. versus Gladiator. It's bloody game. You're going to get action. Uh, number two for me, Ferryman Hounds. Goes yeah. the distance. Fantastic picks and bans. Uh, just, just I, I would honestly watch... Because a lot of people, you know, if they want to just get in a game, watch the picks and bans. I think it was very impactful. I think that whoever was first pick usually was winning out. I think because yeah, of that. won every time. Yeah. Uh, and then number three, you got to watch the Oni Warriors Dynasty fall fall three zero uh, in the finals. Those it's, are my three. In, yeah, I agree with finals. Agree with Hounds Ferryman. I would throw Mambo Warriors on that list as maybe and again one that maybe isn't a must watch for for any reason other than. Mambo looked kind of good, and that was the Warriors continuing and, and turning things around. Also, I, I put Dragons Kings on that list, and it was more so just because the Dragons look good. The Dragons looked really good. Yeah. The Kings did not, and so it was a, a very turn of events from what we saw uh, towards the beginning of this Fair. year. But I think, like by and large, Hounds Ferryman stands up at the top, and like I, I, I didn't think I would be thinking the same thing as you, at least in this regard. I wouldn't have thought to say it. But yeah, picks and bans was like super important, super, I would even argue, say part of the must watch part of that yep. is seeing that that draft mentality for those teams. And I think a, a big ups to both coaches, because I think that is a huge aspect of what they're bringing and what these teams are, are, are like the players opinions in there as well. Yep. What can you play? What are you going to look good at forcing like, hey, Yorm's going to be really solid here. Robin, blah, 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 et cetera, yep. et cetera, et cetera. Tons of fun, fun gods. Gotta give uh, props to Chuck. Gotta uh, give props to if Chuck. If you think about it, at the beginning of the year, this was a team that was not predicted to make it into the SPL. And yeah. now they are. They are very close to so, Masters Finals. They're in the top half. and yeah. Top three, technically. Yeah. So that's insane. Very close to Masters Finals, for sure. My question for you, mm-hmm. and this is this can be a long answer, it can be a short answer, you can it can be no answer, yeah. realistically. What do you expect phase two like what does that look like not in the game but like team wise like who do you think is like rising to the top is it the same teams that we saw this weekend or is it a different set in my mind the ferrymen are going to fall back down um meaning they're not going to be the undisputed top seed yeah. anymore just because i don't care what aurora says <laughs> whether they don't try it or not it's not a tournament so they're not gonna they're not gonna turn it up yeah. until it, it's they're gonna more, be learning exactly and uh, they're gonna be back to learning the meta that sort of thing so i think the ferrymen are gonna fall down certainly not below like bottom four they'll probably just be around hovering between that, yeah, like that fifth, halfway point fourth, fifth sixth um the Ravens are a big question mark for me. They were uh, a favorite of mine to make it to the finals, but didn't feel like they really grasped what the the medal was going to turn into. To, to their credit, not many teams did, if we're honest. I think yeah. three teams in particular really had a, a grasp on what this medal was going to look like towards the end of the tournament. But those are two question marks for me, how, how far the ferrymen drop and how far the Ravens drop as well. As far as looking at the top end, I mean, I would love to see a resurgence from the Kings. That, that, that's a team that it was has always been fun to watch, but recently that consistency has been an issue. The Dragons, I've got big hopes for. Um, the Gladiators are a huge question mark for me because I was seeing a lot of improvement leading up to this tournament, mm-hmm. and then to see them go 0-2 to to the um, to Mambo, and then just be like, we didn't scrim lol. Like that was a big kick in the face. So yeah. I do hope that they. Uh, whether turn it's a roster around. change or whatever, to try and turn something around, that's a big deal for me. Um, and then the Leviathans are another huge question mark because I had I also trended them upwards. Yeah. And see them go out like that, they had a lot more to show, I'm sure. I'm going to go so far as to say, I bet the first two to three weeks of Phase 2, the Leviathans are, are very much in that, like, eh, okay, y'all are, y'all are fine. Yeah. And then it turns up. And suddenly they're going to start winning every set again. <laughs> I think I would, there's going to be like I would the love last, to see it. the last portion of phase two. I feel like that's going to be the Leviathans that we'll see. Mm-hmm. As just then keeping that energy going to worlds, that'll be a big deal. Yep. Kings are a big question mark for me. Yep. I think dragons are still a question mark for me. They looked good. Are the only warriors a question mark it? for you? No, I think they'll still look pretty good. Yeah, I think they will too. I think. I think. I, I literally. I'm not joking. I think it was just 
oh, and maybe an ego thing about picks and bans. Yeah. And that, that, that for me, that was the, the, the big question mark is like, if they didn't let some of these gods through, I feel like they are, they are still pretty top of the top of the tier list. A, I could be wrong. I could, they could just be completely washed. I don't think that's the case though. I would say they got a little, not lucky, but like a little bit, right? Like to, to, to do what? 15 sets in a row undefeated is insane. Mm-hmm. To get as far as they did from a formation of a roster yep. to to the masters of their finals of the first big event of the year yep. and not lose is insane. Totally. And there's like a lot of it that's like, hey, they're really good. Mechanically, they're really good. Some of their drafts are really good. Obviously not the end. But then I think there is a sprinkle of luck to make that happen. For sure. If they can find that same lightning, I would not be surprised if we go into worlds with a conversation of them potentially beating Being their own rec- record. Or, because you know, in that phase, I think they have that opportunity to do it in the phase yep. again. And there's going to be some changes that that they're probably going to have to try and tackle, and, right. and obviously some matchups they're going to have to figure out. But then, depending on how they do in like postseason into worlds, mm-hmm. things like that, I could see them like hey you're going into world's finals 15 and 0 again i could i could see that and i think that would i think that would not benefit them though that yeah they've only lost once as a team right and you learn a lot from losing so if they go into next like worlds and they're undefeated again i think that might hurt them and if they make it to the finals i don't care who they're up against i would say like that that's a that's a sketchy matchup but you're right i think they do still have that ability i'm not i'm not writing them off because of that finals performance and you know what that's stuff that we'll find out and we'll see see what happens. I can't wait. Because it's going to be... Yeah, and instead of in case you missed it, it's, I can't wait to not miss it. And you shouldn't. <laughs> because it'll be phase two uh, whenever that kicks out. That's going to be a little while, though, guys. So make sure that you are following us on Twitter. Make sure you're following the stream on Smite Game. Uh, and make sure that you're watching YouTube.com slash Smite Pro and slash Smite VOD. And There's follow me and Trelly. There's a Reddit. There's a lot of Smite Pro info out there. Oh, there is. Uh, you just want to make sure that you got your, your fingers on the pulse for whenever things are going down. So thanks for watching this and hanging out. And we'll see you whenever SBL comes back.